Hello and you're very welcome to this Game Pit Pit Stop Overview of Living Planet, designed by Christophe Bollinger, published by Ludicly for two to four players, taking 90 minutes to two hours to play. Living Planet is about just that, a living planet. It is far in the future, Earth has been stripped barren, and humans have found other places to live, including this living planet, which is rich with a resource, which is the greatest food man has ever known. However, the planet appears to be fighting back as we're going round, and we are stealing the resources from here and using them. And we're in the final throes of this living planet, attempting to exploit as much as we can before we get kicked out by the catastrophes caused by the planet's reaction to us. How that works out is you're going to play over 12 rounds. Now, everyone starts with one spaceport on one central hex. There's a number of spaceports equal to the number of players, there's different start hexes. And from there, you're looking to explore out to discover different hexes around you, different terrain, different things that you can exploit, and making money from the stock market and building up your own infrastructure. What does a round look like? Well, the first thing is everyone has, I'm going to remove this now, their own deck of planet cards. And each round, each player is gonna select secretly one of their own planet cards and play it face down. And when everyone has selected all of their cards, they're gonna get turned face up. Now, one player is gonna be the leader each turn. And it just rotates clockwise around the table. They're gonna look at all the numbers selected by the different players. And then they're gonna choose what the player order is going to be this turn. And in choosing player order, they're going to take dice and they're going to put them to the number of pips off the order they select. So in this case, we're playing as yellow. We'll choose to go first with our six and then we'll just throw in these other players wherever we decide it's best for us, for them to be. Now, there's a bottom part to this card that only counts if you're the leader and that's going to give you a one off power for this round. So when you're selecting which cards to use, you consider which powers you wish to keep. Then we are going to go through this board sequence, doing each die all the way down to the catastrophe phase in turn until all four have been done, and then leader will pass round and we'll continue round for those 12 rounds. First thing we do is we move down the die to the production line. We're going to look at every space on the board and we're going to see if any of them have sixes in them. In this case, the red player has got a oil factory with a six on it, meaning they will produce one oil and put it behind the screen for them. You'll also see that spaceports have always got sixes on them, and this is one of the reasons why yellow chose to go first, because when a spaceport gets triggered, that's how you're going to get more figures into play. You've got scientists and you've got motorized scientists. To put a scientist into play, you're going to play one of these mycelium and you put them in, and they just happen to be slower but more durable than these motorized science scientists, which require an oil to put into play. We happen to have one, so we'll spend that and we will put a motorized science on our spaceport. Now, everyone gets to go on the turn of this dice. If it triggers a six for your space, you get whatever it is. We happen to have blocked blue and red by going early, one of our choices. Green would now have the choice of spending a mycelium or an oil in order to get one of their pieces in play if they wish to as well, and let's say that they did that. Once we've done that production phase and everyone's taken their goods, we move down to the action phase. Now the player here gets to choose any two actions from a list of six. They can't choose the same action more than once. And the number of pips on here will affect certain actions, which we'll talk about in certain ways. So we need to unveil more hexes as we play the game. First action you can take is an explore. Now there's a huge deck of tiles. There's 23 different exploration tiles. And if you choose to explore, you take the number of pips on your die and you get to draw that many tiles, in this case six, and you can keep one of them and put the rest at the bottom off the deck. And in keeping one, you're going to be looking at various factors on there to decide which one you think suits you best. When you place them, you must check that the sides match up. So we couldn't put mountains to desert or plains there. We'd have to match all those planes together. Now, in putting that down, I have to have a scientist within range of an able to move. Normal scientists have just got a range of one, so this dude can move in there. And the reason these motorized ones are good is because they can move faster and they can move several tiles at once. So we've explored and you get to move one of your figures in there when you explore. If you want to just move around the place, you can just take a move action and again, you can move each of your scientists one, you can move your motorized scientists as many as you want, but your total movement used in hexes cannot exceed the number of pips on your die, which is why a six card is handy if you wish to be particularly mobile. We're just going to move that fella in there for now so we can see what's going to go on later. 
Now, one of the things you're looking at when you're bringing out these new tiles and deciding where to go is these construction spaces, which you can see in the squares, and most of them have been built on so far, because you can construct things. Now, there are factories for each of the five different resources we can see here on this stock market board. In this case, I'm next to a mycelium area, meaning I can build a mycelium factory there, and I'm going to choose to do that. Whenever you're building, it's going to cost you money. All buildings cost five credits. You're going to get a point in the end of the game for every credit you have, so you have to consider that. Also, some of these special buildings will require one resource to build, and we're going to come back to them. But in this case, I'm going to build this mycelium factory. Now, these factories are going to trigger, as we saw in the production phase, and you get one to six on them but when you flip them over it's the reverse side of the die so you can have a six or a one if you're building that one i'm looking down here there's a four six and five about to trigger so maybe i'll build the five one and put it there my scientist has to move in and then i get one automatic, automatically get one of these automation tokens that was easy to say and that means that is now controlled by me each factory on the board is controlled as long as there is a figure in there or an automation token. This one down here has suffered damage. There's nothing in there. So in fact, someone could move and move into that building and immediately take control. Now in terms of taking control, if we had moved our scientist in there, at any point on our turn, if we had five credits, we could pay them and put an automation token in there, meaning it's ours. The other free sort of action you get, it's outside of your two actions, is this scientist here is injured, he's lying on his side. That's because he's been hit by a catastrophe, which we're going to come to. On my turn, I can spend one mycelium, and that doesn't count as an action, and I can stand up any of my scientists for one mycelium each. The other actions we can take, well, we've run out of money, so we can't do our automation token at the moment. There's a trade action. When you trade, the first thing you do is you can adjust the prices in the stock market. You draw a number of cards equal to the pips on your die there. In this case, we're going to draw six. And then we get to choose one, which is actually going to activate. And these will push the price of different things up and down. You're going to choose that, obviously, depending upon your plans. In this case, we want to sell electricity. So we're going to push the price of electricity up three. Now, you need to be careful because if the price ever goes above 10, then that stock crashes, comes all the way down, continues with any remaining moves up, and then everyone is forced to sell that resource if they have any behind their screens. So in this case, we've pushed that up to a price of eight and we get to sell. We can sell three of these and that's gonna get me 24 money back, which is gonna allow me to continue building, repairing and continuing to play throughout the game. And as I said, every five money at the end is gonna be worth one point to you. You can also buy, now when I sold that, it goes down in one, but let's say I feel like I'm short of mycelium, I can buy, but a maximum of two there and they will cost me six each. Now, I can make my stock market actions better by building some of these special buildings. And three of them are linked to the stock market. They're slightly more expensive, but they're going to allow me, for example, to buy or sell multiple goods, not just one good at a time when I take that trade action. There are a couple of other simple actions you can take. One is grants. When you're taking grants, you just look at the number of pips on your die and you get as much money as the number of pips there. So if I chose that this turn, I would have got six money. Or you can take fate control. When you take fate control, you take your one token of these, you can only hold one at a time. That means that between any of these phases, as you move your die down, you can change its value. Now you can see that we might wanna change it for production here, so it produces in factories we want it to do. Down here, you could push it up because you want more action, more moves, more access to stock cards. When you come down here, if I left this die alone, it would be a yellow six triggering a catastrophe. Now, for that yellow six, we would look on the board, as, as you might be able to see, there are various cubes on here of colors and numbers. And if there were any yellow sixes out, that would trigger that catastrophe. So I could use this fate token, change it to a three, and there are yellow threes on the board. There are three types of catastrophe in the game now. They all have the same effect if you're not defended against them. The only difference is you can build certain buildings, which will cost you every time you want to defend against them. For example, I've built a tornado defense up here, which will cost me electricity to defend against tornadoes every time. Right, so yellow three. There's tornadoes triggered down here by this yellow three, and there's acid triggered up here by that yellow three. It was a bad idea to move this dude in there. So we trigger a catastrophe here. When you have a scientist inside a building, they get wounded and they lie down. When you trigger a catastrophe, 
and there's no scientist, there's only an automation token. That automation token now gets removed. That is no longer Red's factory, it won't produce for Red. And it's available there for someone else to walk in, which will start production and also put an automation token. An automation token just means that it will run without you having to have a unit in there. If you've got both, you have a choice. You can injure your scientist, which will cost the mycelium to stand up, or you can remove the automation token, which will cost you five units to replace as long as you remain in there. Unfortunately, when you're outside, you get no protection. Normal scientists will get injured, and again, that'll cost you mycelium to stand them up again. These motorized, quicker ones, unfortunately, have no protection. If they get caught out in a catastrophe, they are immediately removed from the game. So you can see that by manipulating my die, I've caused problems, yes, for myself, but also for the other players within the game. That will be the end of Yellow's turns. We'll go back to Blue. They would go down. All the fours on the board would trigger and people would make things from them. They would take their two actions and they would check for any four blue catastrophes on the board. Once all of them have been used, then the player who is the current leader is going to choose one resource to become more scarce because there's a, only a limited amount of each resource in the game. And they put it in there on the scarcity track and it also counts as the round tracker. When we get up to 12, that's when we get added up all of our points. Most of your buildings are going to score you two points as denoted by these two stars. As long as you control them, of course, you can lose control and someone else can come in and take them. And these buildings that protect you from catastrophes or affect you in the stock market are worth one point each. And I'll say it one more time for every five money you have. That is also worth one point. When you've done that adding up at the end of the 12 rounds, whoever scored the most points will be the winner of Living Planet. My name's Ronan. This has been a Game Pit Pit Stop for the Dice Tower. Check out more videos like this on the Dice Tower YouTube channel and check out our in-depth coverage of gaming on the Game Pit podcast, a proud member of the Dice Tower Network. Thank you.